we are continuing our our chat and ongoing learning together about the different streams of disciple making movements in the world today. And uh, for sure, this isn't exhaustive, but as we've looked at what God seems to be doing, it, it, it seems to be that, and again, as we learn more, we'll keep sharing more and we'll learn from one another. But it seems to be that one of the significant streams or one of the significant strategies that God's using is something that a friend of ours named Roy Moran has developed and articulated. And his book, which some of you might be familiar with, is called Spent Matches, Igniting Signal Fires for the Spiritually Dissatisfied. It's been a great blessing to me personally. And so I'm grateful that I get to share this one. And in some ways, you know, the model that Roy is using in his local church fits well, and in some ways it doesn't fit very well for my context, and that's okay. That's kind of the hope is with each of these different streams and conversations that we're having for our ongoing learning and training, you'll you'll become more aware, but you'll also maybe get a little piece of strategy or a little bit of encouragement of what God's calling you to do in your context as you seek to live out the, the habits of disciple-making movements that, uh, that the Lord's birthing around the world. So if we, if you kind of look at the heart of what Roy talks about, he uses this analogy of a hybrid engine. And for the record, I reached out to Roy and I let him know we were going to be talking about this today. And he said that since he wrote his book, he, God's taught him some new things, believe it or not. So he'd love to jump on with us sometime and he'll, he'll catch us up on everything from the book to now, which, which will be wonderful. We'll look forward to that when we cycle back through this hybrid strategy next time. But the idea of that, if you think about hybrid, hybrid engine, you know, or a vehicle that has, it's the both and. So you got like a battery and you got gas powering this engine and moving it forward. And so the, in uh, Shoal Creek Community Church in Kansas City, where Roy serves, they have this kind of hybrid concept. And I'll introduce that briefly, give some highlights from the book, and then we're going to do some um, discussion together and just talk about what things like this look like in our context. So for them, they really are an attractional church model. And those of you that have been around kind of church growth or the conventional church world, you'll be familiar with that. It's the idea that you create an experience through your worship gatherings that are going to draw people that are not yet believers to the, to the gathering, you know, to the facility where the church is meeting. And Roy was influenced, he would tell you, by the kind of Willow Creek Association and had crafted his church that way. And he tells the story of actually a dream that he had. First off, he'd been praying and praying, like, Lord, help us to reach our whole city for Christ. And then he had this dream that he says turned into a nightmare. And literally in the dream, it was like what he had prayed for was happening. All these people were coming into their one facility, but they didn't have room. They didn't have enough chairs for them. They didn't have parking for them. The highway was all clogged up. And it just was a nightmare of all these people that wanted to come, you know, and be part of this, this uh, gathering that they were hoping to attract people to, but there just was not the space. It wasn't possible for what they were praying for to happen in that context, the way that it was currently set up. And so that dream was one of the things that God used to, to spur uh, Roy on to say, there must be more, there must be uh, something different or uh, something that we may be missing. And so he got connected with a man named David Watson, and many of you will, will recognize that name. And David was involved with the Bhojpuri um, disciple-making movement, church planting movement in India. And through learning the discovery process and some of these habits of disciple-making movements, now what Roy's church does when they say hybrid is they still have that Sunday attractional gathering. And Roy would tell you the stat of, of many and a good number of unbelieving families and couples that come to their gatherings, you know, they meet on Sunday mornings. It's probably not like a conventional church that you might be used to in that they don't sing like Christian songs. They sing kind of pop songs that you might recognize from the radio or popular culture. And then they, they pick those songs based on themes of what the message or what the teaching is going to be that day from scripture to help kind of marinate things in people's hearts and minds and get them thinking about songs and about themes and about life in different ways. And then the message, while rooted in scripture, tends to be very application oriented and kind of down to earth to connect with what people's felt needs are. But in addition to that, you know, that kind of engine of attraction, 
the hybrid piece is their goal is they're attracting people, not just, you know, for the sake of having people join their church, but their real goal is to funnel people into discovery groups where they'll learn how to follow Jesus, learn this discovery process, learn the disciple making habits and begin starting discovery groups in their neighborhoods and their relational networks and their families in their own context. So in a way, if you think about it, their Sunday gathering is an access ministry that they're seeking to use to bring in not yet followers of Jesus who have some spiritual interest in hunger so that they can help them discover how to follow Jesus. And they've created, because we know the discovery group process is really based on relationship. So it's designed to let the gospel be planted within a relational network and flow along relational lines like family, coworkers, neighborhood, that kind of deal. When they create this kind of artificial discovery group, they use the term journey group. They call it a journey group, and it's the same discovery questions that we'd be used to, but they, they have these very intentional, you know, discovery story sets, like things like parenting, um, marriage, um, even like kind of the path that they want people to move along in their church. And he outlines that really well in his book here too. So I won't go into too much of that right now, unless folks have questions, we can dig into it a little more. But that, that journey group concept is giving people an initial taste of what the discovery process is. And then there's always the encouragement to say, hey, you know, be trained in how to do this and do this with your family, do this with your neighbors. And one story that I love is um, those serving in conventional church context will appreciate this is like the season of the year when the sports um, teams are going and parents are not available to come to Sunday morning gatherings because they're at sport events for their kids. And so Roy said, instead of fighting that, he realized I'm going to huddle all these parents and form them as a team and empower them and say, we're going to support you and encourage you as Shoal Creek Community Church to be missionaries or to be disciple makers in this sphere of influence that you have. So look for people that are interested, build relationships with these other parents and, and kids and do discovery with them, you know, while you're having these trip weekends away for your kids sports or Sunday, Sunday morning sporting events. So do these things on the sidelines or get together with these parents. And, and so kind of empowering in that way, empowering this group of families to be disciple makers in their sphere of influence people that came to Shoal Creek because of this kind of attractional model, but then were equipped and sent out. So the, I guess the hybrid context, the thing that I wanted to ask and I wanted to toss out to, to us was a question. And I think each of us here are connected with a local church expression. So the question that I'd love to hear from you on is what does, um, what does that intentional outreach focus or what does that kind of, um, access ministry, what does that look like in your local church? Is there anything that your local church is doing intentional to seek to engage people in your community who aren't yet followers of Jesus? In Roy's church, they craft their whole Sunday morning worship experience to be that way. And I, I don't know too many churches that do it that way other than, you know, Willow Creek or maybe some others similar to that. But what is your local church doing in terms of intentional, hey, here's how we're going to reach out to the community around us? Any things you'd share? You can go ahead and unmute and jump in if you have something, friends. In, one thing we're doing here at Riverwood, and here I'll try to start my video so you can see that. Um, we are we have what's called Solomon's Closet, uh, which is a um, a ministry that a, a woman in church actually heard me ending my sermons uh, asking every time what are you going to do about this and who are you going to tell and she was just feeling you know moved of the lord that she needed to do something about it she did in her words she wanted to be a doer she did not want to be a pew sitter um so she started a ministry uh, to give away clothes because she realized that even uh thrift stores and things have become more like boutique stores when you're paying you know Four ninety nine for a t shirt, you know, it's uh, even if it's used, it, it's like, well, that's that's almost new, you know. I mean, almost the price of a new thing. And people in need, they really need uh, just something given to them. And so, we take in donations, and we've got a huge number of donations dedicated a whole large room to it. 
Um, and it's, it's becoming basically like a thrift store that we're giving away clothes for free. We call it Solomon's closet. You know, why do you worry about what are you going to, what you're going to put on? Look at the lilies of the field and not even in Solomon and all of his glory was dressed like any of these. And um, that has actually led to uh, a number of people uh, hearing, uh, well, even, even being willing to come to one of our studies and things. Uh, so it's, it's really a result of someone saying, yes, I want to do something. And it's leading to other people hearing about it. So it's kind of an exciting thing here at Riverwood. I love that, David. And it sounds like it's meeting a tangible need in your community. Mm -hmm. It's an access ministry flowing from your local church. So that, I mean, that's a great example. Great example. Roy, I think, would say that and some of you have maybe heard him explain that there's poverty in each of our communities and that poverty looks differently in each of our communities in each context as well. We can address poverty by loving, serving with compassion. And then as people see us serving and we're living out loud spiritually, then we can invite people to discover Jesus you know, by getting their fingerprints on his word and get, get together with friends and family for a discovery group. So that's wonderful. The story Roy tells is about he realized a form of poverty in his context was every time a for sale sign popped up in his neighborhood, and he recognized that that represented a broken marriage or a family that was falling apart. So the family would divorce, the house would go for sale. And so he saw, hey, here's poverty in my neighborhood, and we want to address this relational poverty. So that was one need they identified. But love that, David. I've heard about churches that do soup kitchens intentionally, you know, or other even like housing sort of ministries for the homeless, emergency housing, anti-sex trafficking work, you know, that is hubbed out of different churches. Anybody else have a, a intentional way your church is doing an outreach ministry? Ours has something called Community Supper. Every Wednesday night, I think they feed between two and 400 people. So uh, we got a big ministry crew that, uh, supports that but yeah so that's uh that's something our church is doing awesome yeah that's great and in many ways you know friends the as you think about it it's it could be things that our churches are already doing that we haven't yet connected the dots to our disciple making mission or how to make disciples who multiply so it could be a soup kitchen a food pantry uh you know, a clothing closet, like David described, it could be, could be all different kinds of compassion ministries that are already happening, but just helping intentionally. And if, if we're folks that are uh, kind of DMM catalysts or excited about multiplying movements, we can help come alongside and see if there's people that might be interested to be, be trained or receive, receive some tools to help them know how to disciple people that they might find with spiritual interest through those access ministries. So it's not, it's not, it's interesting, maybe in the past, and this has been part of my experience, but hearing people where it's almost like a, an either or, like you either have to share the gospel or you have to do compassion ministry. And it's almost like those two get set up against each other when really it's, we live out loud, we live our compassion and we live out love for neighbor and we live out love for God. And as we do that, we get to look for people of peace so that we can invite them to discover Jesus. You know, it's all part of our way of life. It's not separate. It's kind of two sides of the same coin in a way. Ross, did you want to jump in at all? Yeah, um, we, we typically do uh, stuff around special hol holidays uh, and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, now, uh, you know, some people, you know, balk at the, uh, the we call it trunk or, trunk and, trunk or tree. Uh, so we, we do in our parking lot an, an alternative uh, for the candy um, pass out in the community uh, where people will uh, open up their trunks with candy and uh, you know we'll have anywhere between you know 200 plus uh, kids come to that and uh, opportunity to be exposed to the church and stuff like that so that's one thing we do and then um, in uh, at Thanksgiving Thanksgiving Eve we um, we go out to the uh, trailer courts and uh, the motel that houses very poor people. Uh, and we pass out uh, free pumpkin pies and Cool Whip. And then we offer prayer 
Um, so we, we pushed the prayer envelope on that outreach there. And then um, we, we look for those that are highlighted and stuff. And then we go back like a week later. And if they have a specific need um, that we can pray for or actually meet, um, you know, uh, then we assist them in that process. Uh, Christmas time, uh, we, um, we have a number of different outreaches that we do. Uh, we uh, go caroling to um, the elderly homes. Uh, they let us in. And um, the, I think that uh, the elderly get blessed, but I think the staff are impressed that a church would actually come out and do that, you know. Uh, we even did it during COVID. Uh, in COVID, what we did is we stood outside the people's windows and uh, and we sang and stuff. And uh, it, it was uh, pretty cool. So, and some people, some some of the clients would open up their windows and we're able to uh, share the gospel with them and stuff. Um, and then other uh, Christmas time, we, um, we have an in with... Uh, the school complex, both uh, elementary and high school. Um, so they're able to give us uh, names of needy families that can't afford Christmas. Uh, and so we get lists of needs from those families. The school counselor gets the list of needs and then uh, that counselor disseminates them to us. And then we put that out in the congregation and then people get to uh, pick and choose you know, what they want to purchase for, uh, you know, that given family. And then uh, what we do is um, we either go out and deliver those. Uh, that's the fun part, delivering them to these houses. That's, <laughs> that's really, that's a lot of fun. Or um, if the uh, family does not want us to go into their uh, facility, uh, their home, uh, then they will pick it up at church, but then they're prayed for there. Um, also, too, we, we do a water giveaway at the 4th of July. 4th of July is really big in Tomahawk. Uh, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to Tomahawk on the 4th of July. So we have a big parade. So we do a water uh, handout, uh, you know, and have opportunity to share the Lord with people with that. So those are just some of the things uh, that we do. Uh, and then also we, we're really heads up. Uh, there's like uh, four holidays that... We make sure that um, the preaching is really uh, evangelistic and gospel oriented. In fact, uh, Mother's Day is one of those uh, days that there is a, a really spike in attendance because mothers will bug their families and get the whole tribe in, uh, in church. So my daughter preached uh, this Mother's Day and five elderly ladies, five elderly mothers whose daughters invited them to church came to Christ that Sunday. Uh, so uh, it, it's things like that. You just have to be heads up with your culture in terms of, you know, where you expend your energy and want and stuff. So, uh, but we're also connected with the Salvation Army, uh, the soup kitchen, the homeless shelter. We have people from our congregation are serving in all those capacities too as well. Um, so we're, we're pretty, uh, we got our fingers in a lot of things in our little community here. So anyway. I appreciate that, Ross. Boy, praise God. You know, I won't, I won't ask you all to speak to this out loud, but just consider for a minute, you know, all those, all the different examples that were shared and they're beautiful ones. Are each of those connected in some way to disciple making that multiplies? Does, does each of those initiatives that we all talked about, and I'm sure there's others that are coming to our minds and hearts now for our own local context, ways that we're doing good, are we connecting that powerfully with our disciple-making mission to help invite people to discover how to follow Jesus, right? To learn to obey Jesus. And if not, what an amazing opportunity to make that connection, right? Yeah. So this, I'll, I'll read a little bit from the final part of Roy's book, which he does, I'm pretty sure he says it's a parable. I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, something that's happened to this extent yet, though they have seen fruit like this in neighborhoods in the suburban area of Kansas City where they are. But he tells a story of a couple that didn't even have a Bible at home, you know, if they were honest. God's word wasn't really on their radar. But from being invited to a journey group and going through, they call them the seven journeys of these layers of discovering who Jesus is and who we are in Christ and 
coming to faith and getting baptized and their journey of faith. Then ultimately they started to start discovery groups in their neighborhood where like several houses on their block are coming to Christ. So here's what, what um, right toward the end of this final section of spent matches, he says, this couple, they got more than they bargained for a movement. Others explained an intentional divinely empowered disciple making expansion of the church in a neighborhood region or group resulting in an increase in the number of disciples through baptisms and disciplers groups that are self-propagating, causing a widespread increase in disciples who are engaging with needs in their community and significant spontaneous multiplication of churches or groups, which are spiritual communities. And then this final part, he says, over three years, the Wilkeses, which is the name of this family, could count 60 groups started in their subdivision and well over 75 baptized active disciple makers. Now they were leading the facilitators groups. Their role moved from facilitator to mentor or movement catalyst. They even have a neighborhood gathering at the clubhouse once a month where they sing together, take communion, baptize people who are ready to make their public profession of faith. They don't attend Shoal Creek, uh, Roy's church, as religiously as they once did, but the movement building spirit at Shoal Creek gives them fuel for their fire. Some of the people in the subdivision attend Shoal Creek, but the majority consider what's happening in their subdivision as their church. The story continues. So kind of that, you know, the hybrid, you can hear the both and, the both and there. And some of that might fit very well for your context. Some of it on the, on the very maybe extreme or, or uh, intensely focused attractional side of the Sunday gathering that might not fit as well in some contexts, and that's okay. But, you know, by God's grace, Roy and the Kansas City team and many that have been trained and encouraged by him now through the new generation's work, myself included, God's doing, God's doing great things through this stream. So we praise God for that. 